In this video, we're going to talk about duct sizing. Now, this is an integral part of design and actually fits along pretty well with the psychometric videos that we just finished looking at. And because it all has to do with airflow, we have to deliver the correct amount of air to the correct space at the correct speed for everything to work properly. So, in order for heating and cooling systems to function properly, ducts are needed to supply the conditioned air. These ducts have to be sized properly. Quite honestly, this is probably 50% or 60% of all problems that occur with HVAC systems, specifically air conditioning in residential and commercial properties is the, is the duct work. The duct sizing and damper settings that determine the amount of air Conditioned air delivered to each room is important. The air delivered must be balanced with the room's heating and cooling loads. In other words, you know how many BTUs is required to heat or cool a space, dehumidify a space, and keep it comfortable. The duct work has to be set up to maintain that amount of air. We also have to worry about noise. Okay, Noise becomes a problem if air travels through the duct work too quickly. So this all has to do with the speed of the air or the feet per minute. We have recommended maximum duct velocities. And anytime we're dealing with velocities, we're talking about feet per minute. Okay, we have two recommendations for the main ducts, supply and return. So let's just say for residential, okay, we want no more than 1,000 feet per minute of velocity in the supply duct or 800 feet per minute in the return duct. For branch ducts, supply and return, 600 feet per minute. Okay, now that varies depending on what the use of the building is, okay? Two things velocity does. One, if it's too high, it creates a lot of noise. If it's too low, we're not moving air enough and you could have condensation dust and dirt buildup in the ductwork, okay? So the velocity needs to be proper according to the plans. Also, velocity has a lot to do with duct pressures and CFM, which we'll talk about in a minute. Both the International and Residential Code and International Mechanical Code require residential duct size to be determined in accordance with ACAS, Air Conditioning Contractors of America, Manual D, residential duct systems okay this is code duct work has to be sized appropriately when designing a duct system the following guidelines are used as a general rule you want to install the air handler in a central location by installing the air handler near the center of a building the lengths of the longest supply and return are minimized you want to keep duct runs as short as practical Position ducts to avoid obstacles and minimize the number of fittings required. Never install a duct at the end of a plenum. Always install ducts off the, in the side of the plenums. A duct in the end of a plenum will receive too much airflow and it will be noisy. So to do duct sizing properly, you have to obtain a room by room heating and cooling load calculations. You need to obtain the blower data for the system equipment, also known as a spec sheet. You want to determine the external static pressures for the system using the blower data sheet. You need to calculate the device pressure losses, and you need to calculate the available static pressures. Then, prepare a rough sketch of the duct system, including register and grill locations, distances, and duct fittings. You want to calculate the total effective length for the duct system, then calculate the design friction rate for the system, calculate the design air quantity for each room and each section of ductwork. Then you use an airflow friction chart or a duct calculator to determine the duct size for each section of ductwork. If needed, convert circular duct to an equivalent rectangular duct size. Heating and cooling loads are needed to be known, and you must have the blower fan selected for the installation. You have to know how much air and at what pressure and what speed you're going to get it. The heating and cooling loads for each room are added to determine the total load. Loads of buildings are expressed in BTUs per hour. 
Knowing the correct heating and cooling load of a building, we can select the correct size heating and cooling equipment. Okay, so what you do is you do a room by room heat load. Once you have that laid out, you can come up with your total heat load. And we know that we've, in this case, we have to have 80,000 BTUs of heating per hour. Now you're going to have two columns. You're going to have a heat load and you're going to have a cooling load. Sort of important. The airflow through the blower depends on the speed of the blower and the pressure difference between the blower inlet and outlet. The blower spec sheet will provide a listing of airflow of the blower under various conditions. If you're designing a system that requires an airflow of 1250 CFM, what would the external static pressure be used in designing the duct system? Okay, so if I need 1250 CFM, okay, what what's my external static pressure going to be? Well, I'm going to use a 0.5 at 1250. Just a reminder, total external static pressure is my static pressure of my supply plenum and my static pressure of the return plenum. Drop the signs, add it together. It's an absolute value. So in this case, I'm going to use a blower speed of medium and I'm going to use a 0.5 static pressure. 0.5 is sort of a standard okay for the maximum external static pressure but again it's very important you look at the blower spec sheets this is just an ex an example the pressure difference between the blower inlet and outlet is the external static pressure external static pressure is determined by the duct system and will determine the volume of air delivered to the blower the duct system must be properly designed to achieve the external static pressure in order to deliver the proper air volume. If the static pressure is too high, the blower will not deliver enough air to match the loads. If the static pressure is too low, the blower will deliver more airflow than needed. Think of external static pressure as the amount of resistance the air must overcome in traveling from the blower outlet through the evaporator through the supply duct, through the supply registers, and on the other side, the return grill, return duct, and filter before it returns to the blower. So after the required external static pressure is determined based on the blower data, the next step in the process is to determine the available static pressure. Available static pressure is a measure of the amount of friction or resistance the duct in the ductwork designed to provide the flow of air. This is used to design the longest duct run. So everything we do is based on the longest duct run from the air handler. It may not be the longest if you look at it from a physical standpoint. In other words, if you go from room to room, you may have a short distance, but you have to actually look at the length of the ductwork and that includes the number of fittings. Device pressure losses are pressure losses in the duct system caused by devices other than ducts. For example, an evaporator coil, depending on the coil, can have a pressure loss, or a pressure drop it's known as, be of 0.10 to 0.30 inches water column. Well, if I have an evaporator coil with a 0.30, and if I'm looking for a total external static pressure of 0.5, I may actually have very little room for play because of that 0 0.30. I only have 0 0.2 as my play area. So you can actually start adding different features. For example, if I add an air cleaner to an evaporator coil with a 0 0.30, I have my 0 0.5 right there. It might not work it the way you want it to. Okay, so you might have to do some duct work adjustments and modifications. From a service technician standpoint, this is extremely important to understand, and you have to take static pressures every time you have a service call because people add things along the way. This system may have been set up properly, but if somebody added an air cleaner okay, you may, or a very tight filter, you might have a static pressure that just isn't going to work with the system. The available static pressure is determined by subtracting the device pressure losses from the external static pressure. So if I have a system with an external static pressure of 0.5 inches water column, and if I have an evaporator coil of 0.5, 
damper is a 0.03, air filter with 0.08, and a supply register of 0.03, and a return grill of 0.03, all of a sudden I have a system with very little static pressure. So what is the available static pressure for this duct system? 0.18 inch water column. Okay, so my duct work has to be designed with the 0.18 inch water column. I'm no longer using the 0.5 because we've hit our, we've taken a lot of it away by the device static pressures. Okay, we add the values of the various components to determine the device pressure loss, DPL. So if I take my 0.15 plus 0.03 plus 0.08 plus 0.03 plus 0.03, I have 0.32 inch water column. I have my 0.50 external static pressure minus 0.32. I now have available static pressure of 0.18. My duct system on the return and supply has to be within 0.18 inch water column. Now, the available static pressure is a measure of the amount of resistance the ductwork is designed to provide to the airflow. Resistance results from the air contacting the interior surfaces of the duct. The resistance of the system depends on the length of the duct and also the type of the duct. We'll get into that a little bit more. Additional resistance to airflow occurs any time the air flows through a passage that is not straight or has a change in a cross section. So for example, if the air has to flow through a 90 degree elbow or the air has to go through a reducer, okay, or even a 45 degree elbow, there's additional resistance in that fitting. So every fitting will have a pressure loss. When the air passes through the reducer elbow, it will experience increase in resistance. Ducts are designed by using the concept of effective length. The effective length of a duct is determined by adding the physical length of the ductwork to the effective length values for each fitting in that duct run. Here's some effective length examples. A round branch from a trunk line. You have an effective length for that fitting of 20 to 50 feet. Supply air boots, 20 to 60 feet. Return air boots, 10 to 20 feet. Return elbows, 10 to 45 feet, depending on how tight the elbow is. In order to determine the effective length of each supply duct run, you must first sketch it out. The sketch should include the locations of all the supply and return air return grills and fittings. So here's an example, okay? The longest duct run is highlighted in red. The effective length of all the fittings in this duct example is 114 feet. Okay, so we now have to look at how we got it. Again, I have 12 feet plus two feet plus 8 feet, plus 2 feet, plus 4 feet, plus 8 feet. But I also have the 114 feet of all these fittings, all these takeoffs, all these elbows have effective length as well. So we take my duct length, which is 36 feet for my longest length, and we have to add that 114 feet. So the effective length, the actual length we're going to be talking about is 150 feet. So for all my pressure loss and duct size calculations, I have to use a length of 150 feet because that overcomes the pressure drop for all those fittings. The effective length is the physical length of the duct run plus the effective length of all the fittings. The total effective length is the greatest effective length from a, for a supply duct run in a system added to the greatest effective length of a return duct run. We got to add the supply and return together to get the total effective length. The total effective length of the, 
length of a straight duct run that would offer the same resistance to airflow as the most restrictive supply and return duct runs on a system. Using the previous example, the effective length of the longest supply duct was 150 feet. The effect of the longest return duct was 135 feet. So what is the total effective length for the system? You add those two numbers together and you're going to come up with 285 feet. And again, that's based on this example. Then you have to determine the friction rate. Friction loss in a duct is the pressure drop resulting from the air contact in the inside of a ductwork. In duct design, friction loss is usually expressed in inches of water column per 100 feet of duct. The friction rate for a duct system is the friction loss along the total effective length that results in a pressure drop equal to the available static pressure. Let me say this again. The friction rate for a duct system is the friction loss along the total effective length that results in a pressure drop equal to the available static pressure. In other words, you've taken, you found your longest, you've found your effective length of your supply, the effective length of your return by putting all the fittings and the, and the associated values in, adding it together. Then you find the friction rate for that total length, and it's per 100 feet of duct. Okay, so friction rate, ASP, divided by TEL, which is your feet, times 100. ASP is available static pressure. So then you have to determine the airflow quantity for each room. Airflow equals heat load for the room divided by the heat total heat load times the design CFM. Okay, so determine the room by room design airflow for these six rooms using this formula. The design airflow is 1250. Okay, living room would be 391 CFM. Dining room would be 234 CFM. Kitchen would be 78 CFM. Bathroom is 125 CFM. Bedroom 1 is 234 CFM. Bedroom 2 is 188 CFM. So again, we have our little duct design system here. Now knowing what our total airflow is and our room by room heat loads, we can say, okay, what's the CFM required for each one of these spots? Now, if bedroom number one is 188 CFM, or bedroom two is 188 CFM, bedroom one is 234, we know the main duct going to that area has to have 422 CFM. Okay, again, we start adding together and coming up with what our main duct in each section of ductwork must carry. After we calculate the airflow for each room, the airflow through each duct section can be determined. With the airflow rates and friction rates known, the required duct size can be determined using an air friction chart. Okay, airflow friction charts are a graph of duct diameters, airflow rates, pressure drops for friction, and air velocities. Okay. We have our CFM, which are these lines here. Actually, CFM is across the bottom. So we have 50, 100, 200, 500, 1,000, 2,000, 5,000, 10,000. So you plot the CFM you need. And this red just happens to be our 1050 that we've been talking about. Then we have a line that represents air velocities. Okay, air velocities are at an angle. Okay, and they're, they're numbered, 300, 400, 500. Okay, in the blue one that we have highlighted, okay, it says 500, but it continues to go up. 
Okay, then we have our pressure drops. Okay, these are off to the side here. Pressure loss due to friction. Okay. And then our final thing is the size of the duct. Now these numbers across here are the size of our duct, but it's in round ductwork. It's in duct diameter. Most of our friction charts are based on round ductwork. You do have to convert it to square if you if you use a rectangular ductwork. So for once we have our friction loss and once we have our air the CFM required, okay? We are a, and our velocity, we're able to find where all the points meet and we can find the duct size we're looking for. If you know any two variables plotted on the chart, you can find their intersection. Reading a friction chart is very similar to reading a psychrometric chart. Now, we do have something we have to talk about a little bit, and that's duct leakage. International Energy Conservation Code specifies a maximum duct leakage of 4 CFM per 100 square feet of conditioned space when the ducts are pressurized to 25 Pascal. If the ductwork is tested before the air handler is installed, the maximum duct leakage is 3 CFM per 100 square feet. Okay, more and more as you are installing systems, these tests are required to be made by a third party. Okay, so again, learn to read the friction chart. There's many different versions of this. Okay, personally, I like the duculator, which is a wheel, okay, that you can spin around and line a whole bunch of points up. They have electronic versions of this, but again, know how to read this. And that is a look at duct design. And again, I do want to stress the duct leakage thing. We talked about this when we talked a little bit about our air balancing videos as well.